Human error is unavoidable, but humanity has invented many clever ways to mitigate its impact. Credit card numbers are a neat example. Vendors can quickly validate them with a mathematical test. Double every other digit, starting with the first, and then add all the digits together. The result, 67, is not evenly divisible by 10, so the credit card number is invalid. The customer rechecks what they type, and oops, this one should be a 7. Repeating the doubling and summation, we get 70, which is divisible by 10, passing the test known as the Loon algorithm. The vendor can pass this along to the credit card company to process the customer's order. The key to detecting common errors is this check digit at the end of all major credit card numbers. Intuitively, the process puts the digits into a fixed size box and fills the remaining space with a check digit to keep the contents together. If we receive a credit card and the digits do not fit perfectly in our box, we know they were mistyped or corrupted along the way. The Loon algorithm is good, but not perfect. In milliseconds, it can detect all single-digit typos like we saw with the 1 and the 7. It detects nearly all cases of transposing two adjacent digits, such as swapping this neighboring 2 and 4. However, if a customer transposes this 9 and 0, the algorithm produces the same sum, so it incorrectly passes. The customer now has to wait several seconds for the online store to tell them about their mistake. That flaw is particularly irksome because of how close 9 and 0 are on a typical keyboard. In the decades after the Loon algorithm was published and adopted, two mathematicians independently came up with a better algorithm. The Verhoof Gum algorithm leverages an area of mathematics called group theory to be impervious to all transposition errors. Using the box analogy, it gives the packed digits different shapes to fit together more snugly. As we attempt to rediscover the Verhoof Gum algorithm, let's use the digits 3, 5, 2, 9 as the data we are trying to pack together in the hypothetical box. We need to do something to the digits to find a check digit that packs them all snugly together. That is, it makes the now five digits immune to the common single digit and transposition errors. Thinking about the individual digits as integers, we can try some basic integer operations and see how they fare against single digit and transposition errors. If we change the five to a seven, adding, multiplying, subtracting, and dividing all the digits results in something different, which is a good start. However, if we transpose the 3 and 5, adding and multiplying gives the same result as before. Those operations alone would not detect the transposition. Mathematicians describe addition and multiplication as commutative operations because the order does not matter. Subtraction is not commutative as transposing the first two digits changes the result. But if we swap any other adjacent pair, the result stays the same. Division is also not commutative, but we want the check digit to be, well, a digit not a check fraction, so we will need to think outside the box of integers and basic operations. Hey, speaking of boxes, what about squares? Take this square and rotate it 90 degrees, then flip it over the vertical axis. Take that same square, but flip it first, and then rotate it, and see that we end up with a different square. Maybe we can think of the digits as shapes to unlock new operations like rotations and flips. If we start flipping and rotating a four-colored square, we discover eight distinct orientations, four from rotating it and four from flipping it over an axis. We could make a different square by reassigning colors, like peeling stickers off of a Rubik's cube, but my mom yelled at me for that as a kid, so let's just stick to rotating and flipping. Unfortunately, eight squares is not enough for ten digits. What about pentagons? Turns out there are ten orientations of a five-colored pentagon, just what we need. We can assign the digits to whatever pentagons we want, but to stay organized, let's assign 0 to the original pentagon, 1 through 4 to the different rotations of that pentagon, and 5 through 9 to the flips across different axes. Taking the initial digits, 3, 5, 2, 9, we turn them into four different pentagons. We then need to combine them in some calculation to get that check digit we are looking for. How do we combine pentagons, though? To answer that question, consider the following chain of operations. Take pentagon 9, rotate it by 144 degrees, and then flip it over axis 1. We could make up some notation for this, using P to represent a specific pentagon, an R function to rotate, and an F function for flipping. The chain of operations results in the pentagon corresponding to digit 4, or P4 for short. If we add a 216 degree rotation to the operation chain, that results in one more rotation function on the outside, 
and the expression now yields pentagon 2. This is how mathematicians would combine the four pentagons representing the digits. We treat each pentagon as a rotate or flip function and apply all the nested functions from the end to the start as one big chain. Note the chain goes from right to left, something I messed up a few times when just looking at the shapes. Writing it out as nested functions helped me avoid this. Anyway, I use the circled asterisk operator to mean combined pentagons, but you might also come across the term composition, which means the same thing. The goal of all this is to be able to metaphorically pack the digits, now pentagons, so we can detect if any of them changed. In the Loon algorithm, the final sum was adjusted to be a multiple of 10. What is the analogy with pentagons? Instead of making the last digit in the computation be zero, what if we made sure all the pentagons combined to be pentagon zero? In the 3529 example, we could use guess and check to stick a pentagon to the end, eventually finding that pentagon three makes the final result be pentagon zero. To calculate that final digit without guess and check, we can make use of the fact that combining pentagons is associative. Associativity means that we can insert parentheses wherever we like and it will not change the final result. This gives us a lot more flexibility when dealing with the pentagons algebraically. We can put parentheses around the input four digits, leaving the mystery check digit on its own. Inside the parens is the calculation we did earlier, which resulted in pentagon two. Now we just have to figure out which pentagon will get us back to P0 if we rotate it 144 degrees. The answer is the pentagon corresponding to the 216 degree rotation, P3. Mathematically, we say that P3 is the inverse of P2 because combining them results in P0. Just like negative five and positive five are additive inverses, or four and one quarter are multiplicative inverses. Finding the inverse of all combined pentagons is what we should use as a check digit to pack the box. We can now try transposing adjacent digits and see if the final combination no longer fits in the box. See, when we swap the two and the nine, the result is pentagon four, not pentagon zero, so we know an error happened. Swapping the three and the five also causes the pentagons to not fit evenly, so the choice to use pentagon seems very promising. How do we know if this works for all cases, though? Maybe we just got lucky in the digits we picked. To answer that, we can look at all possible pairs of pentagons in a grid. For example, this cell here represents combining pentagon five from the top row and pentagon one from the left column. We take pentagon five and then rotate it 72 degrees to get pentagon six. Mathematicians call a grid like this a Cayley table, and this one has some neat patterns. For example, to find pentagons that are inverses, we can look for cells that have zeros. Back to the question of error detection. If we transpose any two pentagons, do we get a different answer? For example, swapping P5 and P1 takes us to this grid cell, which we can see gives us a different answer, P9. Notice the location of these cells is mirrored along the main diagonal. We can fold the entire table in half along this axis and see what happens. Most of the folded table has asymmetrical results, which means transposing the pentagons gives a different answer. That's great. However, the non-shaded area shows symmetry, which is not good. For example, if we had a pentagon three and a pentagon four adjacent to each other and they were transposed, we would get the same result, pentagon two. Combining any two rotations is not order dependent, neither is combining zero with a flip. This is so close. Most of the scenarios are fine, we just need to do something to fix the rotations. One trick we can borrow from other check digit systems is adding a pre-processing step. The Loon algorithm multiplied every other digit by two, so maybe we could rotate or flip every other pentagon or something. The ISBN 10 algorithm, commonly used for books, multiplies the last digit by one, the second to last digit by two, third to last digit by three, and so on. So maybe we could do something similar, but with rotations. These are all reasonable ideas in that they introduce some asymmetry to hopefully detect transpositions. However, it is not clear to me if they actually help. We need to prove it. Whatever function we use to pre-process the functions, let's call it sigma, or as a friend of mine calls it, O with a hairdo. The proof I like starts with two pentagons that are about to be combined and applies sigma to the first, but not the second, similar to the Loon algorithm. Then we need to show if we transpose the two pentagons, we will get something different unless the two pentagons were the same. But how do we prove anything algebraic with pentagons? Bear with me for a moment, but what if we represented the pentagons with numbers, specifically by representing a single pentagon with a pair of numbers? The first in the pair, F, represents if the pentagon is flipped or not. Negative one for flipped, one for normal. The second number, R, represents how many corners of rotation the pentagon has. We'll say pentagon zero has zero rotation, 
Pentagon 1 has 1 rotation, Pentagon 2 has 2, and so on up to P4. If we say P5 is flipped but has no rotation, then with 1 rotation we get P6, 2 rotations we get P7, and so on up to P9. Suppose we wanted to combine P2 and P8 with this new pair notation. Multiply the flip states together for the first number. The second number adds the rotations together, but could go clockwise if the first digit was flipped. Finally, divide modulo 5 to keep the second term in the range 0 through 4. The result here is negative 1, 0, corresponding to P5, which matches the shape interpretation. With this new notation, we can try to find a preprocessing function sigma that detects all transpositions and importantly, prove that it works using algebra. Suppose the sigma function added some rotation, which we can note by adding an integer b. To attempt to prove this, suppose we have two arbitrary shapes using four variables, f, r, g, s, to represent all possible flip states and the rotation states. We want to show the two sides of the transposition equation will not be equal, detecting the error, unless the two shapes were equal to begin with. The proposed sigma function adds b rotation, and then we try to combine the shapes. Because f and g are either negative 1 or 1, and we are doing normal integer multiplication, we see that fg and gf will always be equal. Thus, we just need to show that the second value in the pair differs somehow. The plus b term cancels out on both sides, leaving us with fs plus r equals gr plus s. Unfortunately, if f and g are both 1, meaning the original shapes are rotations, then s plus r and r plus s are always equal. This contradiction means that this sigma function does not work. If you want to find a sigma function that works, pause the video now and try to derive one yourself. For a sigma function that works, we turn to a paper by the mathematician H. Peter Gum. The geometric interpretation of this function is that we rotate a flipped pentagon A units clockwise and B units counterclockwise. A rotated pentagon is first turned into its inverse and then rotated by both of those amounts counterclockwise. Now to work through the algebra. Like before, fg and gf are the same, and the b terms cancel out. Moving the a terms to one side then allows us to factor out some terms. Suppose f and g were different. For example, f is 1 and g is negative 1. Combining the f terms leaves us with 2a is not equal to 0, which is always true. a can only be 1 through 4, and if we multiply any of those by 2, we do not get a multiple of 5. Now supposing f and g are the same, we get this other equation. This can only be true if f and s are the same, which means the two pentagons that were transposed were the same to begin with. Thus, we have proved this sigma function will help detect all transpositions. I found setting a to be 2 and b to negative 2 gives us this nice mapping for the sigma preprocessing function. While the two-number notation was helpful for proving things, let's convert them back to pentagons. Even more compactly, we can convert all the way back to the original digits. Because this sigma function shuffles around the digits, it can be said to permute the digits. There's one more detail to address. The proof I outlined dealt with two pentagons corresponding to two digits. How do we scale it up to three or more pentagons while still being sure the transposition detection works? Here, I'm going to deviate from the exact algorithm outlined in the papers of Verhoef and Gum. The variance will be equally valid, but a bit easier to explain and hopefully a bit more intuitive. To start, we need to show that if a sigma is applied to the second pentagon instead of the first, the inequality also holds. The process is very similar to before, converting to pairs of numbers and using algebra. It results in the additional constraint 2 times b modulo 5 cannot be 0, which we already followed anyway. With these two facts, we can take inspiration from the Loon algorithm and apply the sigma function to every other pentagon. If the middle two pentagons were transposed, we want the result to change so we can detect the error. Even though these are shapes, combining them is associative, which allows us to use familiar algebraic techniques. Specifically, we can add the inverse of the leftmost pentagon to both sides. Combining a pentagon and its inverse results in the zero pentagon, which is effectively no operation. To cancel out the rightmost pentagon, we can first evaluate the sigma operation, turning pentagon z into some other pentagon z prime. 
Then we can add the inverse of z prime to the right of both sides, which combines to the zero pentagon, leaving us with just two pentagons, which we have proved will change when transposed. <laughs> Finally, we are ready to assemble the algorithm. Take the digits and permute every other using this function sigma. Then we treat those digits as pentagons and combine them together, being sure to go from right to left. Then we find the inverse of what remains, which allows all the shapes to fit snugly in the metaphorical box, and we append it to the end. For completeness, in case you read the original papers, Verhoof applied sigma once to the first digit, twice to the second digit, and so on. Gum took a similar approach as ISBN 10 and applied sigma once to the last digit, twice to the second to last digit, three times to the third to last digit, and so on. The choice of gum in ISBN 10 might seem a bit strange, but it allows for any amount of leading zeros without throwing off the calculation. Both of these approaches only require proving one of those two inequalities, but the programmer side of me feels like that leads to unnecessary complexity when implementing the algorithm in practice. There you have it, an algorithm that is slightly more resilient to errors than the commonly used loon algorithm. Hang on, I promised group theory as one of the ingredients. Where did it show up? As it turns out, the pentagons we met are also known as the dihedral group of order 10, or D5 for short. Group theory celebrates identifying patterns, such as the fact that the pentagons and the two-digit pairs we saw are effectively the same, because their Cayley tables are the same. If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, group theory says it is isomorphic to a duck. <laughs> Proving the algorithm was correct using just pentagons would have been very difficult. Using group theory allowed us to substitute in pairs of digits, which opened up our mathematical toolbox to let us finish the proof. Just like a baker practices with many ingredients and techniques, a successful mathematician learns subjects like group theory to have many resources available to solve their problems. The description has more resources below if you want to expand your mathematical toolbox. Happy learning!